Here we go. Welcome to this talk. My name is Nicola Ferro. This talk is about building server applications using Objective C and Linux. Um, well, the reason I'm giving this talk really is because this is a, an argument which most people kind of ignore. Uh, actually, GNU-step is, is usually identified with this uh, GUI development framework, uh, mostly for GUI applications. But in fact, it's composed of two parts. One is GNU-step base, which is a new graphical kind of foundation, Objective C, and the other part is GNU-step GUI, which is more for the graphical stuff. Now, GNU-step base is actually the most complete and truly tested and extensively polished part of new step. So it's actually a really cool and finished piece of software you can use. But it's really little known <laughs> it's actually little known to the public in a sense. Uh, the company I work for has been running very large scale applications on this uh, like big messaging servers or SMS with done videos of stuff. Um, and it really works really well. And so I always wonder why nobody else was doing it. So I give this talk just to give an overview of what you can do on how you can use this stuff. Um, by the way, if you've been to the talk yesterday, this is kind of a copy and paste from that. Uh, Objective C, which is the language used by GNUSTEP, is obviously the programming language. If you're using GNUSTEP to do server applications, you are going to use Objective C. There's not much point otherwise. Um, well, there are some other options which we'll discuss in the end, but this is your, your main option. Obviously, Objective-C is a strict superset of C, meaning anything you can do in C also works in Objective-C. Um, you can uh, compile and link uh, Objective-C libraries in your Objective-C program, which means particularly for server stuff. It's, it's great, you can take OpenSSL, you can take whatever else you have. Just any C library, you can just link it in and use it. Uh, so the main difference between Objective C and C is that Objective C adds a number of um, new features if you want. Some syntax, some constructs that you can use that allow you to define classes, create objects, instantiate methods, invoke methods, etc. And actually, quite a few pretty advanced stuff that um, sometimes you don't even find in higher level languages like forwarding or categories, etc. Uh, why, so why is Objective-C so special? In fact, why is Objective-C so good for server applications? Because I think it's a, it's a perfect match. And the reason is, first of all, it's, it's just C. It's compatible with C libraries. It can be as fast as C if you just use the kind of C subset of it. So if you're using writing your server and you just that bit of code that really needs to go really fast, you just write C code. You just use C arrays and iterate and everything. But if you, you can also use its object orientated extensions to structure your software like in a very good high level language to your nice design patterns, very dynamic. And then the nice thing is you can mix the two things. So once you have a bit of experience, you can actually kind of change your style and have a bit of part more C-like, a bit of part more small talk. So really it covers a, a wide range of things and applications you can do with it. Um, so it's extremely flexible. And actually for server applications, it's, its foundation class library is really powerful. It's really good and it's brilliant. Now, why? I think I already answered that. Anyway, why would you use Objective-C for server applications? I already said that. It's very fast. You can mix it with C. Um, it's an high level language, which you can use for to design your stuff properly. And you've got this powerful foundation library. So let's have a quick look at the foundation kit, um, which is what this talk is mostly about, basically. Uh, first of all, GNU-step base, which is this thing, actually implements the foundation kit uh, defined by this API from 1994, um, which defines a number of classes uh, for an objective C foundation framework. You've got, we'll go through some of these 
classes later, just to give you a better idea of the capabilities of this library. But basically, you've got obviously the root Objective C classes. You've got strings, numbers, data, etc. Arrays, dictionaries. Very interesting for servers. You've got one loops, timers. I talk about that later. You can do I/O, the notification, a lot of stuff. Yeah, okay, so this was the open step kind of API. This is how Blue Step actually does it. You can run your stuff on any operating system, in particular all the various Unix variants, which are probably what you're most interested in. You need a new Objective-C runtime, which is shipped with a free software foundation GCC, so you don't really need to do much. And obviously that's, that's a bit, that's Blue Step base. Okay, so let's have a just a quick look at what actually you need to build server applications with the new set. First of all, you need GCC. Um, most uh, Linux distributions, for example, have got a separate pa package called GCC, is like iPhone of C, which just gives you the Objective-C compiler and Objective-C on time. You need GNU step make, which is a small make file library. Um, it's the official GNU step build system. Basically, you write very small and clean make files and then use the make will take care of all the compiling and linking and porting to, to other platforms. Um, and finally, obviously you need to use the base, which is this implementation of the um, foundation kit framework, which provides you with this core objective C classes you can use. A couple of important dependencies that you actually need. Uh, well, you need DBXML, um, which everyone has it. Uh, you, this one is a bit um, unusual. You, you need this library called libffi. That's because Mustafay supports forwarding, which means um, you send a method to, a to an object, and then the object, we don't even really know what method was called, can forward the method to another object, which is very good in certain, very advanced design. But anyway, you just download that library, install it, and, and that's it. If you want to use uh, HTTPS in the base, like you want to be able to connect to HTTPS servers, or actually write an HTTPS server, you probably want to use UTLS or OpenSSL. Obviously, you just install those libraries. Uh, now, I have a quick look. And this is just to give you an idea of how easy it is to install on Ubuntu. I just picked up an uh, distribution. You just need to do apt get and start package that will then get all your dependencies and you're ready to go. This is instead if you're installing it manually, which for example is what my company does. We install all our servers manually. Um, so you, it looks imposing, but actually that's really all you have to do. It's not much. You need to install a couple of so GCC, LibXML, OpenSSL, obviously. You get libffi from from that. You just do configure install. At that point, you may if you do like that, it will be stored in use local. So obviously, you just need to make sure the linker will find the libraries edited and so the point. Then you get you start make you configure make make install. You get booster base the same. We use OpenSSL, so you, you need to pass this back, enable OpenSSL to configure. And the only really kind of unusual bit here is you need to source the script. That, uh, there are ways where you don't need to source that at all. But as a first start, just to make sure it all works, you source this script, which will set your path, set your library path, and you don't have to worry about that. Once you're a bit more familiar, you can actually do an FHS style install where your program send up in USB, your libraries in USB, and you actually don't need that. Okay. So let's have a very quick look at um, how you compile it, actually an Objective C use the base program. This is a trivial example, the same example I used yesterday. Um, that's so we import, this is the, the main header for the foundation kit for the step base. So once you import this header, you have um, access to all the new step base functionality. And this is just the tiny 
and it's log actually right to the standard barrel so it typically you use it in service to log stuff and that is a static string the syntax at and then the string um, is actually a static ns string which we'll talk about later um, this is an example given make file which compiles that thing actually if you have more files to compile the make file is exactly the same you just list them all here all your source code files then you type make and will work so the structure of the new make file first uh, you include this comment of make then you specify you the name of your program which is hello and the objective c files composing the program and here you can just list them all and then you include this thing this other make file fragment which builds tools now there are different make file fragments to build different things like libraries bundles which is like a plugin that you can load in your program a tool is basically just a, a known graphical objective c program so for server stuff if you're doing a server that is exactly what, what you should use once you once you've written this uh, if you've sourced that script which will actually will define this variable you have all the usual commands so you can type make it will build you can do make clean, make this clean, you can do make install, which will install it. It will give you quite brief uh, um, output, like compiling file. If you actually want to see the, the GCC command line, the link, exactly, just add these messages before yes, and it will be going to variables mode and print everything that it's doing. Uh, you can also use it for make install, for example, if you want to see where things are going. Actually, it then supports a lot of other stuff, like test view, all the stuff you usually expect. Um, but probably, you just need to know to know that. And when you type make, it will tell you there's a special target you can run to get help, and it will be printed in, in the first line. Okay, at this stage, I was planning to do a quick demo, but with the, with the thing, I think we'll just keep that. Anyway, basically, if you put those two files in there and type make um, it will compile them so that it's not that great and then we'll see. okay now if you're actually trying to do this where do you do you start um, first of all you need to just know a bit about objective c about this glue step based foundation kit we're using this this page has got a number of tutorials which i actually wrote myself um, we, and it's a good starting point like for those make files for some classes use the base as an extensive API reference which I think is pretty complete ok, almost complete <laughs> and that, that's, that's kind of the URL so when you don't know what a method does what a class does, which class to use you can go there and just walk around <coughs> you can actually, I didn't list it here, but you can actually also go on the Apple website and look at their foundation kit, which is a similar API. So sometimes it may be a bit misleading, but now, okay, let's have a look at like the, ba the basic classes of GNU step base. <coughs> such as uh, strings or arrays or dictionaries, etc. It's got quite an interesting design. You would expect you can't do much uh, much with those such basic stuff. Everyone knows that you implement it. But actually, you use the base, the foundation kit, adds some very interesting ideas in, those, in the design of these classes, uh, mostly for performance. One thing it does, it uses this class cluster design, which means Basically, it's a, it's a way of optimizing the classes without kind of changing the API. So when you, when you create an NS string, which is a string, you don't always get an object of the same class. You get an object of a, it's called a concrete subclass, which actually is optimized for that type of string. But because Objective-C does uh, dynamic dispatch, when you call a method of the object, then depending on the, on the concrete class of the object, a different implementation will be used. That means if you create a Unicode string, or if you create an ASCII string, you use exactly the same API, you don't need to know which type of string you have created. But the library actually will know. And when you do things on the string, it will 
use the optimized implementation for that type of string. That also is done for arrays, for dictionaries in some cases, and you can even implement your own subclasses. So if you've got a particular type of string of array or array or that you really have your own way to optimize it, you can actually implement the subclass and then pass it around wherever a string is required. You can pass a string of your own class with your own optimized <coughs> stuff and it should work. The other thing is there is a distinction between mutable objects and non mutable ones. So um, you've got NS string and you've got NS mutable string. That allows you um, that allows the classes themselves, like when you put strings into arrays or dictionaries or do things, to actually optimize quite a lot because it knows that a string, an NS string can never be changed while an NS <coughs> So I didn't say that. <laughs> so the difference is a normal string, like an NS string, is a string you create and you can never change. If you plan on changing it, you should create an NS mutable string, which and then you can add characters, remove them, etc. So let's very quickly have a look at these base classes. This is, for example, any string. Um, this example is. Um, the thing also supports static strings like this one. Again, this is basically allocated by the compiler. Um, obviously, an string is a string class. It's got full Unicode support. Um, and one thing which is really key for server stuff is this class class implementation means ASCII strings are still extremely fast, even if there's full Unicode support. So you can, anytime you want, you just put a Unicode string in it and it will work. But if you put the ASCII string, it will still be really fast. So, unlike Java, for example, where strings are really slow because it's always in kind of Unicode mode. Depends on the implementation. Um, this is a, a typical array. That's a property list, which is a way of describing those these collection classes when you serialize or deserialize them. But anyway, it's just to make sure you understand an array is this thing. While a dictionary is kind of an associative array or hash table, depending on the terminology you use. So it's, it's more like that one. So you've got keys equal value. Again, you've got, it's important to know if you use the API, the only thing you really need to know is you've got the array class, sorry, the NS array class, this type of there, which is static stuff. If you want to change them, you <coughs> use an NS mutable array. And for dictionaries, is is actually the same. Now, I don't have time to go through all of the glue step based classes one by one. I just want to mention a few ones that may be good to know. So if you go and look at API, you know where to look. Uh, one thing you probably want to do if you write in a server is run loops. Like your server will, will start a run loop and wait for sockets to connect in or wait for some time to arrive to do something or for something to happen. That's a typical thing. So for that, you, you will use an NS run loop. You've got a full event-based model. You've can have got NS file handle that allows you to do IO, which is your integrating with your run loop. You've got NS timer. If you want to use threads, um, you've got this class called NS thread, which you can obviously use. Uh, for locking, you've got NS lock, and there's another bunch of stuff. Um, another very nice feature of booster bases is, is called notifications. Um, it's pretty easy once you get into it, and it's really kind of addictive. It allows you to, to connect objects in a very flexible way. So you've got this thing called the notification center. That's the class NS notification center. You <coughs> can have objects which can observe notifications. So they specify, I don't know, you have an object and you specify that it's waiting for the NS file download completion thing, <coughs> notification. When something else will post that notification, your object will be informed that that event has happened. You specify which method you want to be, to be invoked when, when that happens. So you've got a notification center, you've got the various observers that are observing notifications. 
then something else will post the notification to the center and all the observers will get informed. That's nice, it's a kind of standard design pattern because it allows you to link basically the observer to the object posting the notification without actually themselves even knowing each other. There's this notification server in the middle that acts as a flexible. Obviously, if you actually want to use it, just have a look at the notification center. If you look in the GNUSEF code, you will see it used a lot. And it's, it's a very good idea to use it in your code as well, because it's really flexible. The other thing that GNUSEF by is, the GNUSEF in general do a lot is using delegates. Now, this is not really implemented in the library in the sense that you don't need the library to provide you the ability to create delegates. But it's something that is almost everywhere in the API, and it's actually something you, you want to do in your own APIs as well, in your own code. Um, a delegate, basically, the idea is in object oriented stuff, you usually subclass a class to extend it. The problem is sometimes that's very heavy, you have to create a subclass. It can be quite messy. Delegates allows you to extend a class without subclassing. So you've got your um, you've got your class that, that does something, and then you add that just the usual method set delegate and a method to return the delegate. And then whenever you're using an instance of the class, you can set a delegate. And then the class obviously when it's processing, at some point you check if there is a delegate, and if so, we call the method of the delegate to ask for to delegate some of the processing to it. Um, it's very flexible. And it's really good. So it's um, if you actually even if you are not going to do this, <laughs> it's a really good thing to have a look and see how it works in the OpenStack API, etc. Alex, that's just like C sharp delegates, right? Function pointers. Because Sorry, I'm it's similar to C sharp delegates, right? Where they're basically function pointers. That you no, it's totally different. It's totally different. Yeah. Uh, so you do have a function pointer, but um, you just like. Usually, if you have a delegate, uh, then you ask the delegate whether it implements the method or not. Right. So it's totally dynamic. But whereas in C sharp, um, it must be already there. It must be defined. It's not a runtime thing. So it, a delegate is an object. Yes, of course. So you've got your object, then you've got another object. Let's say you've got, um, I don't know, an HTML, an XML parser. And you want to do SACS stuff where when it finds a tag, it will actually call a method in your code. So you could have a delegate, which is what you're supposed to implement to actually react to events. And then in the XML parser, you send the delegate to whatever object you want. And then when it finds a tag, you will call a method of the delegate, which does something and goes back. And it finds another tag, and you call the method. So that's how it works. That's the idea. Okay, I, I'll see that actually, because I, I mean, I, I think I understand the point, but not how that's too different from C Sharp, but you also do it at the right time. Yeah. Uh, sure, the only thing uh, similar to that is the name in C Sharp, but it's really different things. Okay. Good job, one of the layers. Yeah, yeah, no, thanks. Yeah. Uh, anyway, that's my question. It, anyway. I would say it is a standard design pattern. I'm sure you can find it in almost all the other, uh, but here it's really used like. Yeah, but it's this here. It's similar to this here. Is it? Mm. Well, actually, you can have really delegates in Java as well. Yeah. Just we do all the time. The difference is that an object of C, uh, you do not invoke methods directly, but uh, you, there's actually a concept of the selector, which is which represents a message, uh, and it's completely decoupled from the lookup process in the class. So, so the delegate or something. Uh, as a delegate can be completely dynamic. You don't need to know in advance what methods are implemented in there. For example, if you pass an XML, you can write a class which has methods like uh, begin or for any tag, you could write a method and uh, the XML parser could dynamically ask the class whether it's implemented and if so on. So it's quite powerful. No, I understand the stack, but it's like Python just has that to it if you're looking at it. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Sure. Another thing that Mr. Bay <coughs> another thing that Mr. Bay provides is something called distributed objects. Again, that's uh, basically it's remote method invocation. You have there's millions of implementation of that. But this is quite high level and natural and does use, again, some of these Objective-C really dynamic stuff. 
So um, basically what you do is you've got your process, you've got an object in your process and you can expose it to the network so other processes can call methods of that object. The fact is the way you use the API, it looks as if that object in a remote process is actually in your own process, is like an object like everything else. Um, it's very, very natural to use. It's great if you've got a number of processes that need to talk to each other, but are separate processes and just sometimes invoke methods of each other, etc., which can be handy when you're building servers, etc. Um, now, I don't have enough time to go into that, but I wrote a nice tutorial on this, on that web page, so you can have a look and just, um, just get an idea. Uh, now, I... Yeah, I thought I would look at a few of the most useful libraries you can use if you're doing server development with Objective-C. Obviously, the first thing you can use any C library you want, which is a big, a big thing, actually. Um, if you notice that it does provide a number of um, server kind of libraries. Um, most of them are in the DevLibs module in subversion, but I go through the most interesting ones in this talk. Then you've got other parties that provide some very nice Objective-C libraries, for example, SOPI from the Open Google project, which is a full application server. We'll briefly mention that later. And obviously, there are some libraries for Apple Cocoa that you can use. They're written in Objective-C, they have a very similar API. Some of them are actually officially ported to GlueStep, so I don't know if you've got some weird format you need to parse, you may find something for Apple something for Apple that will just do it. First thing we're going to quickly discuss is just the database libraries because if you're doing server development, chances are you will need to connect to a database. Um, the first thing you can do obviously is just use your own favorite C library if you have one or so if you're connecting to Postgres you could just use the Postgres C binds and just use that. Um, Gnusta provides two database libraries, which I will discuss in great detail. One is called SQL Client, the other one is called GDL2. Finally, if you use SOPI, for example, SOPI has got its own database layer, which obviously if you're using SOPI is definitely the best choice. If not, <laughs> I'm not so sure, you probably just want to use one of those. Let's have a look at these two. First of all, SQL Client. SQL Client is, is just an SQL layer. So it's pretty kind of low level in the sense you write SQL code and you just execute it. Um, has got backend bundles. A bundle, as I was mentioned before, is kind of the terminology for a plugin. Uh, has got plugins for the different uh, databases, Postgres. Current, these are, are the ones that are currently provided in the standard distribution is Postgres, MySQL, SQLite, and Oracle. The focus of this library is really on high performance and it really does provide cool stuff there. It does connection pooling, obviously. It does all the transaction support. Now, and obviously it does query caching, so you can do a query and say that you want it to be cached for 10 minutes. So if later on your code does the same query, it will just hit the internal cache. The other thing you can do very nicely is batching updates or inserts. Uh, if, you, if you're doing really high performance stuff, um, <coughs> it, becomes, it can become important to just batch a number of writes in a single transaction, which is executed faster. So this allows you to, as your code goes, you can add things, you can add statements to be executed to a transaction, and when you reach the end, you just execute them all. And if the transaction fails, you will actually, if you want, just retry all the insert of updates one by one uh, to make sure that you, if one of them is wrong, you won't destroy your entire transaction. GDL2 has got a completely different uh, approach. It's trying to go for the high level stuff. So this basically provides you an object to relationship mapping framework. It will automatically convert your database stuff into objects. It allows you to, it does, it does extensive use of those KVC, KBO things, which are so cool in Objective-C, which allow you to change stuff into other objects, observe them, react. So, and basically, 
strong MVC pattern, uh, very nice stuff. Has got an SQL layer, layer at the bottom, which again has got different adapters for different databases. Um, it's really good for rapid development. Um, so you've got this, well, I'm going to these classes, but there's a number of classes. It even has got a good program to model your, your database and then, and then work on it. How do they compare? Well, if you're performance oriented, you, you just want to use a SQL client. That makes sense, particularly if you basically go into write and tune every single query anyway. If you require that level of sophistication in terms of performance, obviously you don't want anything to generate queries for you. You just want to write your own, tune them one by one, and then you should just go with a SQL client. If you're looking for a for a, an island framework where you can work properly with properly designed stuff, etc., models, objects, etc., you don't want to write SQL GDL tools for you. Performance is generally good. Um, I have to say it's a bit hard to get into because it's modeled over an old framework from Next app called UF. So the people who knew UF are know everything about this. The people who have never used it it's usually a bit hard to get into. But once you get into it, usually people just fall in love with it and say it's the best thing ever. Question. Go. How does the maturity or GDO2? compared to the majority of EOF, let's say, five or six years ago. Good question. Anyone who...? No. My opinion is fine, I don't know what I'm saying. Well, I can give them the floor. I think GDL2 is supposed to be beta yeah. at the moment. Um, I think there are people using it in kind of real-life situation, in production, but... Um, for example, I'm not sure all the adapters are fully tested. I know the Postgres one works really well. I'm not sure, that sure about the elements. So it, it may not be as polished as... Uh, my question was not so much about the adaption of... of uh, so the database adaption, yeah, sure. but was more about um, the framework itself. I used to work with you uh, yeah. uh, from 2000 to 2003. Yeah. So um, it's been five years since I looked at it. Of a sure. But um, it was really good, and I can imagine that this would be better because it's, uh, it's not uh, it's something that since then, and it has the, I guess it has the same uh, tactics as the web uses. Or it has or exactly the same API, <coughs> the same class names, <coughs> but I can't tell you how mature it is. I, I didn't test it. Uh, okay. okay. That's okay. Um, <coughs> I, I was just curious, so my sure. curious thing would be... Uh, I think they are better okay. suited ones. Excuse me? Um, okay. Nicola? Uh, is it a, um, a requirement of uh, GDL2 that there is a database behind? Sorry? Or is it... Uh, is, is GDL2 just a... a uh, an object persistency... No, 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 okay, sorry. It, it's a database type. So you've got like Postgres, yep. you got it, and then you, you in your application to access Postgres, you use GDL2. So you've got... Okay, so the, but the but point is you have you have a SQL database in the first place and you want to use it. Yeah. But you could... You, you, you have you could no, 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 but... Um, because I wanted to ask a kind of tricky question. You say the uh, once you use the GDL2, you never want to use it. But what about uh, object or, uh, object oriented databases like uh, Gemstone or? Good question. Like uh, I don't. Hello. Oh, That's the question. Yeah. What about uh, object oriented uh, databases? Like <laughs> no, because uh, Nicola said uh, once you use the GDL2, uh, you never want to use something else. But if you could just uh, start a transaction, uh, transaction and persist your objects without building, doing anything. Yeah, that would be an object that we don't have on object see, right? Yes. The problem. Yeah. Yeah, one You're quite right. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is um, that it's just a map on object relation data is map on. You have lots of trouble, like with the transaction page, for example. 
then um, uh, your, your object graph that you want to, to save to the database is obviously not the same like the context of the object or the database. But actually, actually using uh, uh, GDL two properly as well, but using UOF, you could write an object database pretty easily because uh, the high level stuff, which for example binds the user interface to the database, mm. it's completely separate from the storage layer. So you have but something which is part of the object store, which does all the mapping. If you would uh, want to, you could just utilize <coughs> the objects and write them to the disk. Yeah. It would be possible. You can describe it or yeah. something else. Yeah. Just my question was, uh, what if there was no mapping layer at all? You don't need to do the mapping using uh, GDL2. It's actually two parts. One uh, part is uh, tracking the state of the object which you could reuse in your object database backend. Mm -hmm. It's some kind of transaction, in-memory transaction. So it tracks all the changes to the object, and when it saves uh, those changes, you could either write the objects as, yeah. a, as a serialized form, or you could, that's where the mapping kicks in, or you can serialize them to, to a SQL database. Yeah. But it's really independent of that. Uh, those are two different parts. Mm -hmm. yeah. There was also one time a flat file adapter for EOF. So you could yeah, just. It's different things. It's, it's, it's already mapped. Yeah, but we talking you don't need a database as such. Okay. 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 Another library which definitely used for this use that provides this library called Web Server Library, which allows you to implement quickly. Um, basically, HTTP servers. <coughs> this is not really for building web pages. It's more for you know API kind of transaction on APIs where someone is calling your API to do something, you know, connect to your database or something. Um, it provides a, a kind of full web server. Usually, use it with a Apache font. It's quite handy if you actually need to do that. And in case you need to interface with Java stuff. There's a GNU step to Java interface, uh, which allows you to use Objective C, object classes, etc., from Java, and vice versa, Java stuff from Objective C. Um, it's very cool, it does work. There's a number of cons, though. Uh, it can be slow, so you don't want to overuse it. Um, if you have a problem, it's hard to debug because of the cross language calls. Um, Support for cross-language cross subclassing is actually a bit limited and uh, it's not easy to port to other platforms. And one of the last things I wanted to mention was SOAPI, which is uh, a complete, basically, web application server environment. It's got an extensive set of frameworks to do a lot of stuff, which you usually want to do those things. Um, it's kind of compatible with Apple Web Objects, <coughs> even if it's got its own uh, Zopi concepts and extensions, so it's not perfectly happy compatible. It's kind of clearly derived and mostly looking. It's not even trying in some areas. Oh, it's sorry, not it's even not trying. trying. Sorry. Uh, it does. It does do. It's got a lot of stuff to do XML processing. Um, XML RPC, obviously, going site, etc. It does MIME, IMAP, etc. There's LDAP, as well as on database stuff. And it does iCloud of parsing. If you're interested, that's the URL where you will find more information. Questions? Yep. You forgot to mention Twisted Web. Oh, yes. Yeah, sure. library which is. Um, Models are compatible to Apple Web Objects or Next Web Objects as it was this time, 4.5, yeah. I guess. And it uses, um, in contrast to Web Objects today, which is now Java based, it's still an Objective C. And the API is a little bit different, the prefixes are not. Um, WO, but some um, GSW, whatever. Can you, hmm? can you configure? You can configure that. You can configure it. Oh yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah, it's 
I didn't know that. So it, it's supposed to be 100% compatible with web objects and the alternative to Zopi. And they I just looked at the class names and I thought, hmm, what's that? Yeah, so you don't know it really internally. Okay. Anyway, yeah. so if you if you read into web objects, which is this uh, web development framework by Nextstep originally now by Apple, Zopi is a very good one. But there's another project which is Goonstep Web, yeah, which is is more compatible, uh, less uh, advanced. Though. This I, is I, I doubt that. I highly doubt that. What do you mean? Yes, I think they are they are stating that they are 100% compatible, but I think the core compatibility is even much better. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we have four Sorry. legacy applications: the Sophie and they work. Okay. Any more questions? Well, in which case, thank you very much. Uh, if you want more information, that's the website. It's a mailing list. You can ask questions. And good luck.